Ready. 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 Ready, the story of the United States Marine Corps Reserve. It's a story which began 50 years ago, when the full might of the United States of America was felt on the world scene for the first time. 50 years ago, when the United States Marine Corps, born in the revolution, maturing with the nation, created a reserve. In 1916, there were only three officers and 32 men in that reserve. But a year later, when Marines embarked to fight the war to end all wars, that number had multiplied to 6,500. By the time the transports reached France, another great Marine tradition had been established. It was impossible to distinguish the reserve from the regular. And so it was in training behind the front on Liberty and Paris, Calais, Bristol, and Ypres. So it was in battle. It was in June of 1918 when they first met the enemy. With Paris at their backs, the Marines stopped the Germans at Chateau Thierry, driving them from Belleau Wood. A month later, they were in Soissons, smashing the enemy flank with devastating surprise. At Mont Blanc, in the face of fanatic enemy resistance, they took the high ground, disrupting the Germans' defense plans. While the Marine Moles fought the ground war, the Marine Hawks served valiantly in the air. They were over the battlefield as the Marines cracked the enemy's final defenses in the Meuse Argonne. When the war ended, the Germans had given them a nickname, Devil Dog. French had given them great honor by proclaiming that henceforth in all official papers, the Bois de Belleau shall be named Bois de la Brigade de Marine. The American people had given them 1,600 personal decorations, eight distinguished service medals, and five congressional medals of honor. Now that it was over, over there, Americans couldn't forget over there fast enough. As the 20s roared on, things military mattered least. The Marine Corps Reserve dwindled to less than 600. But these dedicated diehards refused to surrender to the mood of the times. They bought their own shoes, uniforms, and equipment. They maintained their own armories. They paid their own camp expenses. They bought their own medical supplies. And to keep their armory warm in Washington, D.C., they borrowed heat by piping it from the adjacent police headquarters. The understanding men in blue looked the other way. But the whole country was looking the other way. The post-war binge of the 20s had given way to the national hangover of the 30s, the Depression. And yet, the country came through, and so did the reserves. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in Again, the reserve was ready. 15,000 men, dedicated beyond easy comprehension, became the advance echelon of more than 400,000 men and women reservists who were to follow them into the Corps. And again, reserves and regulars merged into a single fighting team 
and for the duration, neither the saltiest drill instructor nor the most seasoned general could tell one from the other. Not at Guadalcanal, where Marines fought America's first offensive action of World War II. Kwajalein, where side by side with army comrades, they broke the outer defenses of the Japanese Empire. Saipan and Tinian and Guam, no one could distinguish between reserve and regular, whether it was the Marine in the air or the Marine aboard the Navy ships or the Marine on the ground. The Navy Marine team fought on through Peleliu. of Iwo Jima. Japanese bastion of Okinawa. They came home again. And again they returned to Main Street and to the college campus, to New York and Duluth and Atlanta and St. Paul. They married, they built homes, they had children. They started businesses. They began to sell stocks and bonds and shoes and groceries. They became engineers and accountants, movie stars and pilots, teachers and senators and musicians. But some things had changed for the country and for its reservists. Berlin and Greece and the Iron Curtain and the emergence of Red China were deterrents to another post-war binge the United States emerged as the world's greatest power, and its citizens knew that with power came responsibility. And so with only a five-year respite, again the reserves were called. Today's action by President Truman called reservists, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine back to active duty to meet aggression in Korea. And again, the Marine Reserve was ready. They came from their offices and stores and factories and once again teamed up with the regulars. They sailed from the west coast and a month and a day later they were climbing the seawall at Incheon in one of the most spectacularly successful amphibious assaults in military annals. They fought through the streets of Seoul night and day for 48 hours, taking on Russian tanks and North Korean troops. And they drove the enemy back into his own territory.
and in the epic battle from the chosen reservoir to the sea, surrounded by five times their number, they created a legend matched only by Thermopylae. One third of the marine pilots whose aircraft shepherded them through the assaults of weather and the enemy, and 50% of the men on the ground were reservists. But again, it was impossible to distinguish between World War II alumni and Korean recruits, between reserves and regulars, between the old breed and the new. When the Marine Reserves of 1950 returned, they came home to a nation more aware than ever of the compelling need for a strong and ready reserve. Devoted to peace and freedom, the United States no longer needed to be reminded that a great nation must have strength to pursue peace and freedom to seek freedom. But reminders were forthcoming anyway, with every morning's headline. Lebanon, Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Vietnam. Alert to the needs of the times, the Marine Corps has adopted new weapons, developed new tactics, and reconstituted its reserve. To back up the three active duty division wing teams, and now an additional division, the Corps has the fourth division wing team within the Marine Reserve. While the regular division wing teams meet their commitments around the world, over 40,000 citizen marines, identically equipped, spend two days each month, two weeks each summer, landing on the beaches, firing the artillery, building the bridges, setting up the communications, repairing the trucks, driving the tanks and Amtraks, operating the radar, teaching the recruits. Deployed in simulated combat across every kind of terrain and every kind of weather, these Marines, in the tradition of the reserve, are ready. Ready, too, are the pilots, the mechanics, the ordnance men, the electricians and the meteorologists and communicators. Maintaining air cover over the ground troops, photographing installations, smashing defensive positions, bringing in supplies and reinforcements. They all work together as the reserve division wing team. For the citizen marine, perfecting military skills is only half the job. As much citizen as marine, he serves his community in recreational programs or at the blood bank by providing toys for a million needy children through Toys for Tots or by sending boys to summer camp. Through his efforts, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been made available to buy the food, clothing, shelter, material, and educational resources which will help Marines in Vietnam win the battle for men's minds and hearts even as they are winning the battle against the enemy. And this program in the long run will be a major factor in assuring ultimate victory. As a citizen then, the reservist is ready and as a Marine, he is ready. <laughs>